Lotus's mother was at the opening ceremony of the temple in India when she was four years old. So now her daughter is named Lotus and who, she will read the opening prayer for us. Lotus? Oh my God, oh my God, unite the hearts of thy servants and reveal to them thy great purpose. May they follow thy commandments and abide in thy law. Help them, O oh God, in their endeavor and grant them strength to serve thee. O oh God, leave them not to themselves, but guide their steps by the light of thy knowledge and cheer their hearts by thy love. Verily, thou art their helper and their Lord. Baha'u'llah. Wow. Well done, Lotus. Proud of you now. If we give Rashida's logging in, we'll give her a minute to log in. Oh, she's here. Alawa. Yeah. Hi, Rashida. How are you? Good, thank you. What are you doing? Rashida is my favorite kid sister. <laughs> so I asked my granddaughter and my kid sister to read prayers today. So Rashida. So I'm going to uh, chant this hidden word. Mm -hmm. Oh friend. Abandon not this everlasting beauty for a beauty that must die. And center not your affections on this mortal world, world of dust. <clears throat> Edos Jamal e Fani me Mahuho Kar Jamal e Baki te Dor na ho na Edos Jamal e Fani me Mahuho kar Jamal e Baki se Dor na ho na Aur is khakistan dunia se Dil na lagana Hai dost Jamal e Fani me Mahu ho kar Jamal e Baki se Dor na ho na or is a Pakistan Dunia se Dil na lagana Edos I will introduce you to Mr. Saba here in a minute, but before I go do that, I want to point out that Mr. Saba, after his presentation, will answer some questions. Uh, for those of you that are here on Zoom, you can post your questions in the chat section of the Zoom, and we'll present those to Mr. Saba at the end of his talk. For those of you that are coming in on YouTube or Facebook, etc., please send your text me your questions and I will read them to you. Uh, read them to Mr. Thava. Uh, my phone number is 281-788-0380. Again, my number is 281-788-0380. Uh, in, in, in trying to compile uh, 
bio for Mr. Saba, I got online and I recognized quickly that I couldn't do it. He has a bio that is about six or seven pages long and you don't want to hear me read his bio to you. Uh, sufficient it, it is to say that Mr. Saba has been responsible for, for some wonderful buildings, Baha'i buildings around the world. He was involved, he was an associate architect for the design of the seat of the Universal House of Justice in Haifa. He was also associated with the design of the 18 terraces leading from um, on Mount Carmel. But of course, his piece that he did, he designed and he oversaw the construction for is this beautiful temple in India that the call described as the Lotus Temple or the Temple of Bahapur. Um, it is a building that receives, according to studies, over four, well, this was all before COVID, by the way. It received four million visitors a year and it the probably it is the most visited building in the world. Uh, there nothing even comes close. Uh, Mr. Saba has won been recognized for his architectural work by most countries in America, Europe. Um, he has received awards for his work in that in the constructions of the buildings that he's done. He has also received awards for his lighting design. Um, he has been written up in over 50 magazines. He has appeared in universities and colleges presenting the Baha'i faith and the buildings of the Baha'i faith. There are no words to describe the achievements of Mr. Saba, so I won't. But I will tell you something on a personal note. note. I have been to the temple in New Delhi. And I have seen the pictures of the temple in New Delhi. There is no picture that can do justice to being at the temple to the actual building. It has an aura about it. It, it emanates spirituality. It is just wonderful. And I hope for those of you that have been there, you will get a chance to go back again. And for those of you that have not yet been, you will get an opportunity to visit. I'm delighted, I'm excited that Mr. Saba accepted our invitation to speak to us here in Austin, and I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Saba. Mr. Saba. Yes, Allah upon your friends, and uh, uh, it's my pleasure to be at your service, at your presence, and I hope uh, uh, I will be able to give some information that it's uh, interesting for you. And in the year 1976, uh, the Baha'i World Center, Universal House of Justice, announced a competition, international competition for the design of an international project in India, the Baha'i uh, temple or the downing place of remembrance of God, Mashraq al Askar, as it is named by Baha'u'llah in Kitab Aqdas. Uh, at that time, I was just a fresh graduate from university. I was very young. And uh, uh, to some extent, I knew the challenges of building a building not only a building, a temple in India, but it took me 10 years difficult way to learn the real difficulties as I was struggling with the construction and completion of the design. A temple in each religion has direct uh, relation the definition of devotion in that religion. What's the meaning of devotion about that? What is it? It's every religion, it has a different meaning and a temple has different functions and different definition in different religions.
in one uh, temple, in one religion, temple is a place of um, really contemplation and prayer between devotees and God. In some temples, they are a place for social gatherings, getting together and discussing about religions or about the po politics or about the events of the, um, the time or a ceremony that somebody talks to us about God, what is this and what is that? But Baha'u'llah in his most holy book, Kitab Aghdas, defines the temple completely different. Of course, uh, uh, you know that uh, um, quotation and uh, Baha'u'llah says that in every city, in every land, there should be a temple. It should be built in the most beautiful way that it is physically possible in the world at that time. And it should be built in the name of the Lord of the religions. The Esme Maulikel Adyan, the Ahsana Mao Yumkena Fel Emkan, the Esme Maulikel Adyan. It's a very, very fine point here. Most beautiful. Why? Why beauty is so important? In an interview with the CBC News in Canada, the interviewer asked me that it seems Baha'is, they worship beauty. Is this correct? I told him at the serious risk of being completely misunderstood by you, I say, yes, it is correct. The name of God, this is another thing. The most famous one of them, maybe if you want to call five most famous architects in the entire world, I'm not talking about the world of religions in the world of really uh, uh, commerce and uh, if you call five names, one of them is Moshe Safdi. Most famous is he was born in Israel in city of Haifa, but became famous in Canada, in Montreal. And uh, in the famous building of Habitat. And uh, later on now he has building all over the world. He's, he has, he's the, the one that uh, built and restored the Jewish section of the Jerusalem uh, and several museums in Israel, Holocaust Museum in Israel several museums all over the world. His famous library in Canada is that uh, rotunda in, in Vancouver. And his buildings in United States are monumental. In a talk, uh, I was also invited to give a talk about spiritual space. And uh, Moshe Safdi also was one of the speakers in that, in Yale School of Architecture. He said, it is so interesting for me that there is a religion in this world that their God is called Jamal, beauty, Baha'i faith. He said, it's so interesting for me that there is a religion in this world that can make garden, a temple, a place of prayer. And this is true. He said, I became architect because I was inspired by the Baha'i Gardens in Haifa. Because my house, when I was born, it was very close to Shrine of the Baal. And I was inspired by this building. Anyhow, this is it. 
جمال مبارک The blessed beauty is the name of God. Jamal. Blessed perfection. Kamal. These are the name of the God in this dispensation. Why? Because, because uh, beauty is crystallization of a spirit in material world. If you want to find a parallel to spirituality, to spirit, to that refineness, that letafat, that perfection that should be in everything. The only thing equivalent to that in world of material, because you have to make it like something that we can see, we can understand that we say. Beauty is that perfection of a spirit that has that that it shows itself in everything i'm talking about beauty of creation god presented his own beauty in the nature in human being bob himself says that god has invented us created us so that we perfect his perfect creation. He says, if you want to, it is our duty to bring every, everything in this world to its heaven. And he says, heaven of everything is its perfection. So that is why the Baha'i temples are beautiful because beauty is the magnificent perfection of God that he has put that in everything in this world. If there is one thing I hate in this world is Beatles, Susk. I don't like it. But there is a museum in Egypt from Beatles. My God. They are so beautiful. The colors, they have the colors that, emerald color, colors, gold, silver, the beetle, because God has put essence of its beauty, of his own beauty in everything so that we see his fingerprint, the fingerprint of God in everything in this world, it, its beauty. That's why Baha'u'llah wants us to build a temple most beautiful. And for who that you're building that temple? For Baha'u'llah? No. For God? No. For the God of religions, there is anybody has any definition of God, we built a temple for that definition. Not for my God, not for Baha'u'llah's God, for any God that you think that is God. Even if you don't believe in God, you still believe in some force, some, some energies, that, that God. You are building a temple in the name of that God. Why? Because the Baha'i faith has one major teaching, and that is unity. I'm sorry, sorry. The most important demand of the Baha'i faith is justice. The most beloved of all things in my sight is justice. Justice. What is definition of justice? How justice can be established? By unity. Unity. Then, all of us are one. All of us are equal. All of us have the same right. All of us have the same opportunities. This is justice. So that is why we are not in this world in order to establish unity of mankind. We are in this world to establish justice 
and justice can be established only by unity of mankind. So the main message of the Baha'i Temple is unity of religions, unity of God, unity of religions, unity of mankind. That is why we call House of Justice, Universal House of Justice. You may be asked if the head of the Baha'i faith is a court, Universal House of Justice? No. The Baha'i faith is in this world in order to establish justice. In our daily namaz, obligatory prayer, what we read is this. Every day we read this. O thou who art the Lord of all names and the maker of heavens, I beseech thee by them who are the day springs of thine invisible essence, the most exalted, the all glorious, to make of my prayer a fire that will burn away the whale which have shut me out from thy beauty. In another prayer, Baha'u'llah says, oh my God, Make your beauty my your beauty my food. Make your beauty my food. That is what we need. The beauty of God is our best food. That is what we need. Otherwise, as far as temple is concerned, Baha'u'llah says, you know this prayer, every child in Baha'i, Baha'is, they know that. Blessed is the spot and the house and the place and the city and the heart and the mountain and the refuge and the cave and the valley and the land and the sea and the island and the middle wherever mention of God has been made, that is blessed temple. Entire world for Baha'is is a temple. We are not building a temple that we go and pray there. In fact, we are encouraged to pray at our home. There are so many beautiful quotations that if you pray in one spot, if you choose one spot of your home and pray every day there, that place becomes, attracts concourse of high. That place become a temple, your home. We don't need to go to a temple to say a prayer. We go to a temple to see the beauty of God and to go to the presence of one God that is my God the same God or your God or a Muslim guy, God or a Christian God or a Hindu God or a Buddhist God or a non-believer God. If we want to we, what is prayer? Prayer is we are giving thanks to God. We are giving our gratitude to God. What is the best way to give your gratitude to someone? Tell me, if you want to, if you love work, artwork of Van Son Van Gogh or Leonardo da Vinci, how you can grat give your gratitude to him? By respecting his paintings. By being 
respectful to his paintings. If you want to say gratitude to Beethoven, what you will do? You will go and thank Beethoven? No. You will admire, you will appreciate, you will enjoy, you will play, you will learn, you will get drowned in the beauty of his music. If you want to say thank to God, you have to become intoxicated in love with his world, protect his world, protect his birds, protect his insects, protect his animals, protect his people, protect his nature, his river, his water. So Rabbi Seperi, our famous Persian poet, he says, Mardoman Dehebala Abra Mifahman, Yel Nakardandash. The people of the upper village, they have understood the water. They didn't make it muddy. Ma, we also should not do it. That is the way, that is our prayer. That's what Baha'u'llah says. That's what the Bab says. You know, we are the, the most famous, I mean, Al Gore. Al Gore, the vice president of United States of America, and the famous, the man that for the first time brought a documentary about nature and protection of environment and all of that in his book says that the Baha'i faith is the only religion that in its own body of in its literature, maybe because it was, it came up at the industrial period of history of mankind, he says, in its body of its religion talks about protection of environment. We Baha'is should raise the flag of protection of environment. That is our prayer. It's just, Abdul Baha says, when a painter, an artist is sitting and putting his or her uh, brush on the paper, at that time he is in a temple. He is praying because he's creating beauty. So these are very, very important things. We do not believe in a temple where God is there, sitting there, and we are going there. Look at the, what many of the temples in India is doing, where people go there and feed the, feed the God, and they think that this is it, this is God, and he will, they, they don't realize that we are, God has created us, has given us total freedom, has sent his teachers and doctors and medis medications and medicine and everything for us. And he says, take care of yourself. And he wants only one thing for us. I demanded the greatness for you. Distinction for you. That is what I want. Everything else, he wants us to be healthy. He wants us to be happy. Everything else, everything bad that is happening is not happening by God. So I had two challenges to design the temple in this competition. One was that the temple should be beautiful. Second, the temple should, be, should welcome people from all the religions, from everywhere, should welcome them should bring them, they should feel this is their own temple. They should come in and they should feel comfortable to say prayer the way that they want. The first day that I saw several Muslims are saying namaz in temple in India while Hindus are saying their prayers sitting there and like that, I really cried because I could not imagine such a thing that a Hindu and a a Muslim, they sit next to each other. They never do that. 
They never go to a temple. You have to show them that. You can, it's not enough that you leave the door of your house open and say that everybody is welcome. I will not come there. What is your agenda? Why you want me to come to your house? You have to show me that love. You have to call me in. You have to welcome. You have to give that feeling to me. This was supposed to be in that temple. So that that temple is the temple of the Lord of the religions. It's not only a Baha'i temple. Baha'u'llah tells us that uh, the essence of all the religions is one. He says, is one. He doesn't say it should be one. He doesn't say that you Baha'is go and make everybody united. No, he says the essence of all the religions is one already. It has always been one. 500 years ago, it was one. People misunderstood. Today also, we may misunderstand. God knows, I hope not. We should not. This is, they understand, this is one. What does it mean? It means that there is only one religion in this world. Already, there is only one religion. People, they call it differently. And small details that has needed to be adjusted based on period of time. The essence of God, relation of man with God is one. It is same as it has been at the time of the people in the cave. So I thought that if, if, this, if we believe as a Baha'i to this principle, so I should be able to find that, that thing. I should be able to find uh, uh, that um, we have this, I should find something that represent that unity in all the religions, the DNA. I have to find a DNA in India that it is in the body of a Christian, it's in the body of a Hindu, it is in the body of a Jew, it's in the body of a Baha'i, it's in a, a DNA. We have to find that DNA. What is that? I can find there. So if I do that, and if I can show that, so you see that this DNA is mine, I think that it's mine, Everybody else thinks that it's theirs, so we have we can establish that unity of the thing of of God. I don't know why I cannot change my slides. Uh, yes, so uh, there is the, the India is the country of temples, magnificent temples. Look at this. This is a Madura temple. It's a. There are seven balls in 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 each other. There is a mandala, seven rectangles inside each other, becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And each rectangle has four sides and has one gate like this. This is a gate. So there are seven by four, 28 gates like this. Each one huge monster. And each one, all that you see on these things are millions of statues, statues there. So temples, we are talking in a country that temples are defined with tremendous complexity in order to represent spirituality because the world of a spirit for them is so complicated. It should be like your journey toward God. And this journey is tough, it's complicated. Of course, Baha'u'llah says my religion is so simple. Shariat is somehow, it's simple. It's so easy. So I was trying, I looked at all of these temples and these temples are so different. Each one, at the top of every hill, there is a temple. And that temple is, and then I found that, um, that when I was looking for that DNA that I mentioned to you, I discovered the lotus. 
Lotus is not my discovery. It is nothing that you need to go and find it. It is everywhere in India. At the back of every truck, there is a Lotus. Every truck. And you wonder why, you don't know. It's the, the flower, national flower of India. It's the sign of the famous party that is governing right now, Bharata Janata party. Their symbol is Lotus. Buddhist, uh, sorry, before Buddhist, Hindus. Hindus, they believe Brahma creator of the world was born in a lotus flower that has grown from the navel of Lord Vishnu that is laying under the ocean. From his navel grows a lotus and in that lotus Brahma creator was born. So they consider lotus to be a temple of God. Hindus, Buddhists, they believe the same thing. You can see here, God, all of the, this, unfortunately, we don't see the entire uh, um, statue, but this God is dancing on a lotus flower. The bottom of this slide, you can see that at the bottom, if you look, you can see this, it's a pedestal of lotus because the lotus grows in the polluted atmosphere, but it stands above it. It doesn't, it becomes, it's still, it's always, it's mud, it's, it's slum. It grows in a slum, but it's white or purple and beautiful, clean. No dirt is making it polluted. So that is why all of the gods in India are dancing on a lotus. Look at that. Here, Buddha is sitting on a pedestal of a lotus. You can see the leaves of the lotus on the side of it. Here, you see the lotus completely under his, his uh, uh, throne. Buddha says, human being should be like a lotus that lives in this muddy, dirty, polluted world, but should remain clean and spiritual and be above it. So, and the same thing is in Christianity, the same thing, the Professor Jung has written three volumes of books about symbolism of, of uh, Christianity and um, it is uh, uh, Lotus, the symbol and the mandala is the mother of the plan of all of the churches, famous churches of Christianity. But the, the dome of Taj Mahal, Islamic monument, is a lotus bud. Look at this. You can see the petals of lotus here. But in Persepolis, you see in the hand of the kings and queens and the uh, um, um, generals of the army, you can see the symbol of Farah uh, Izadi, greatness of God in the form of a lotus. Um, so the lotus, as I thought that the DNA that is same in all of these religions is lotus. And I chose that one and I started, but the, I thought that this is something that all of the Indians have seen it every day. They pray toward it. Oh, ye jewel in the lotus. <laughs> Oh, ye jewel in the lotus. Oh, mani padme om. I should say om, not om. It's Persian way of praying um, in Hindu language. It's, uh, that means, oh, ye jewel in the lotus. Who is jewel in the lotus? Brahma, God, is jewel in the lotus. And what is the jewel in the temple? The greatest name of God at the top of it. So we, I um, chose that one. And um, uh, the, of course, it's also so beautiful. And uh, um, that was the, um, 
Now, um, when I went to India, when I went to India, I realized that we, we are strange. We are a foreigner. I am a foreigner. Baha'i faith is a religion that they think it has come from outside India. And, all, and they, I, they have to understand that this temple is their own temple. Right opposite our temple in India, there is a very, very famous Hindu temple called Kalkaji Temple. Kalkaji Temple belongs to a goddess, the most vicious god of India is a woman. And that is called Mataji or Kali. Kali or Mataji means dear mother. So uh, the dear mother is the god that represents the wrath of God. This is right opposite the temple. So when I went to India, the first thing I did, I went to to the te- to uh, to uh, this uh, um, temple r- opposite our temple, and I talked to uh, to this uh, uh, to this uh, um, um, priests pandits that they are there, and I told them uh, about what we are what we are doing. I told them that. Um, uh, uh, we are here. I said that, please, now imagine these are the people, these are the type of workers, laborers. Right when I went to India, this, they, this is exactly our construction site. They were excavating the foundation of the temple at this time. At this time that nobody knows what is this building and we are going to build. And uh, uh, the, these are the type of laborers that they are working. I went to the temple and I met with the priests of the temple that they are spiritual people, leaders, and all of that. And hardly they, they don't understand one word of English. And I've gone there. I want to, I went to the temple. I pay respect to them, to these people. I met with the with five of these priests in the temple. I had sent a message that I want to come and pay respect. Then I went and I told them that I have come to build this temple. This temple is not any different temple. This is your own temple. This is Kalkaji Temple. This belongs to Kali. We are building it. What is Kali? Lord of religions. Lord of religions. Baha'u'llah says we are building a temple in the name of the Lord of religion. Kali is one of the Lord of religion in Hinduism. So this is your temple. We are building it here. And we ask you to come and bless it. Come there. See this one. We are building that. and. We, I pay respect, we presented some sweet and gifts and all of that, that is tradition to have to put it in front of the gods. And I did all of that and we came. And uh, uh, then we started, my God, this is the way that you have to pour concrete in India. These are the labors. I have sent a, a British project manager because I didn't want um, architects. Normally, they don't do project management. They just design the building, and they are involved in the beautiful part of the job. The dirty part of the job is done by others. So they, I told, I left. I, I had a Mr. Watson, a very distinguished, fifty-six years old at that time. I was twenty, some years old, a kid really. And I wanted. To, I sent this man to India, and he went there. And he came, he just was constantly complaining that, my God, these are not workers. This is not concrete. How we can do this work? We want to build some kind of things like that. And anyhow, in about a year time, he went back to, for a holiday and he didn't come back. So I had to take over the task of project construction myself. And, um, First thing that I decided was what Baha'u'llah has said. Bad mashno wa bad mabin. Wa khudra zalil makun wa adil bar mayar. Don't see bad and don't hear bad. He doesn't say that they are not there. He says, you don't see it, you don't hear it. And don't make yourself down by getting mixed in these kind of things. Don't bring your status down to nothing. So I said, if you have, you have to follow what he says. So 
I remember the first time we had gone there, my children had arrived, my wife and my two children had come there and we had, we were sleeping at, at, at home and there were two big lizards on the roof, on the ceiling. And they're, and this, my kids were so scared. My God, what are these things? I said to them that these are our pets. This one is Georgie, this one is Georgette. They are going to be here. They said, they are not going to fall down. I said, yes, sometimes they may fall down. They will eat lots of mosquitoes and then they get heavy, they fall down. But they have nothing with you. You have to accept them. They are here. This country, there is not a single room without lizard. Even the house of president, if you go there, there are lizards up there. So we have to then look at the beauty of the things. And then we started that. We looked at this, we worked with these workers. Then we realized that yes, this woman is working. This head load is 25 kilogram. Try 125 kilogram on your head once you see. And she is working for $1 a day, eight hours work, which is normal which was absolute normal salary of the laborers at that time in India, in the unskilled labor. But look at how she smiles. She's happy. And after a short period of time, I realized that there is such a nobility in these people. I realized that Baha'u'llah tells us that God has in created a jewel in every being in this world. It is our duty to discover that jewel and show it to them. It's, if we believe everybody in the world believes that the God is just, if God is just, how is that? He can create something good in you and doesn't create anything good in me or anything good in this woman. Baha'u'llah says he put something jewel in every being. You have to find that jewel and you have to help them to find their jewel. Then they become, they will become brilliant. They will show it. And then this is what I was trying to, uh, to do that. And uh, so imagine this temple, I created school for them. We had 150, this is one of the classes, 150 kids that they are naked, they have no, they are, but they come at the construction site and they are there. They play normally in all of the construction site, they play. Some nail goes to their foot. So what? I mean, they pull it out and throw it out and they continue. And they have no education, no nothing. We create, we pray at the school. Teachers, these are the teachers at the back. Uh, they, they came from, I we invited them from a mobile crash that they come and teach them. And uh, I want to talk about the nobility of these people. These people, the tools that they have, I will show you some of their tools. They're so funny. So primitive. They bring in a certain day, it's called Vishva Karma Puja. The day that they put all of their toys, uh, their tools, they put it in front of them. They bring a priest, these are the priests, to say prayer. Thanking God for giving them those tools. That believe me, you will not accept any one of those tools in your garage. I will show you some of them. I've kept all of them in the museum at the temple. The tools that was used in the construction of our temple. All of them that day, they sit here. And this is the Mr. Watson that I told you, sitting here. And you see that he's not happy at all with all of these people that he used to. He says that, you know, these are monkeys. You want to build a magnificent project with monkeys? They are scared from the vibrator because it moves. They are scared. They are farmers. They come from during the season, they come to. And, but later on, you will see that no, they are not monkeys. They are jewels. They have jewels in them. And you can see, it's unbelievable the things that, you see, imagine we are going to build this building with this geometry, with this accuracy, with those people. And imagine we have done it. It's a miracle. Look at this. This is the white concrete in that dome that has received the award, the best concrete of the world from United States, the best concrete of the world from England.
And look at this, the perfection of concrete. This is not painted. It's touched, untouched concrete. Of course, right now it's not like that. If you go there, pollution has made it brownish. It has not been clean for a long time because it's so difficult. But uh, of course, it's possible, but you have to do it. Uh, you have to do it. These are the toys, the tools. This is plum, a plum. That building, that building does not have one straight line, one straight line. Everything is curved, double curved. This dome is combination of nine sphere that they have gone into each other. Nine spheres, they have gone like this into each other. Look at that. This is one, if you continue, sphere. This, this is one sphere. This is another one sphere that they've gone into each other and they've cut each other. Not a single line. So everything of this building should be built with coordinates. X, Y, Z, three coordinates. And coordinates should be established by Plum and, but, but it's it's done in United States by theodolite and electronic levels. These curves, this geometry, not one single line is done by that. And those people are not used to centimeters. They measure things by hand, very, they say, one inch here and there, it doesn't matter. This building is so accurate, plus minus, two millimeter, it's accuracy. It's written in several of the magazines that are published. They are, House of Justice have said that there are more than 400 publications in the Baha'i World Center that has coverage of this temple. And now this geometry we are going to work and this dome, imagine in that heat, Temperature sometimes goes to 50 degrees Celsius. 50 degrees Celsius. Do you know what is 50 degrees? It's really beyond your imagination. Celsius, not Fahrenheit. Uh, you can calculate it, how much it is. It is beyond the, the metal, the, the temperature on the metal was 56 degrees. You had to, I, if I wanted to go up the structure, you have to use uh, gloves that you can, you can touch it. It's so hot. And all of these workers, they are working on this. Now, my structural engineer wanted to do this. They said, you are building this. We have to build it in layer by layer, layers of one meter each, one meter, one, 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 one point one, 1.2 meters maximum each. And I was telling them that I want entire building to go as one continuous concrete. And they said, this is crazy. You cannot do it. It's impossible. And in fact, my structural engineer, my British structural engineer, Dr. Flint, left the meeting. He was so angry. He told me that, you know, Mr. Saba, you are arguing with me because you are too young and you don't have experience. If you knew what are you talking about, it's impossible to pour a concrete like that at this height. The weight of the wet concrete will be so heavy, no structure can tolerate it. And this, this leaves are some of them, the dome that I showed you inside is only two inches thick. This, these, petal, these petals are only two inches thick, two inches, five centimeters. And you, you have to pour concrete in between in one piece, it's not possible. And I was talking about an absolute crazy method that I was insist that it's possible and but Dr. Flint left the meeting and said that, sorry, Mr. Sabo, it's not possible. Then he left the meeting. My Indian enge engineers, the young engineers, they were all more or less my own age or a bit older. And they had no experience whatsoever in that. And they told me that, Mr. Sabo, are you sure you can do it? We can do it. What you say? I said, yes. I was not sure. I was sure because Baha'u'llah has said, that if you work hardest possible for what you think is correct, you will receive confirmation. And I was sure that I have done maximum that I can do. 
And I think it's possible. And I said that I have talked to those workers nights and nights, showed them, they call it film. I showed them film and videos. And I told them that they are going to do a miracle. It has never been done anywhere in the world. A concrete like this, shell structure like this has never been done in the world before this project or after this project. In fact, on a lecture that I gave in Princeton University, head of the office of Louis Kahn that still is functioning. Of course, Louis Kahn is dead. Louis Kahn was the president, uh, was the dean of the School of Architecture in Yale for several years. And he's very famous in India for his building in Ahmedabad. Those that they know is one of the most famous architects of the world. And that at his time, of course, he's dead now, but his office functions. He said that, he said, when I come, came here, I had come to criticize but when I see the building, I realize that the things that for years I thought it's absolutely impossible by best technology of the West, this is exactly written in the, uh, the uh, magazine of the Institute of Architects of United States, uh, Record Architecture, it's, a, no, sorry, Architecture. Later on now, now the, the official magazine is Record. At that time, it was Architecture. It says that the best technology of the West failed to achieve shell structure of this height, this level, this length and height. And the most primitive technology of India has done it. I talked to those labors and I was sure that these noble labors will try, will do their best and we will, be, we will succeed. Imagine they are making all of the concrete at one. The operation needed 400 laborers to work in 48 hours, in four shifts of 12 hours each, 12 hours. They have to work like ants. I will show you now the slides, you can see that. And look at this, the workers, look at the safety shoes, helmet, nothing, it's not possible. I was insisting to the contractor that you have to do this. The, the contractor said, Mr. Saba, you give them those shoes, all of them will fall down and will die. They have never walked with those shoes. Only they walk with the foot like that, or with what they call it, chapal, their slippers. They, they walk like that, only, nothing else. <laughs> so what can I do? I, you see, all of them, they had helmets. All of them, they had all of the safety things but you couldn't force it to it because they couldn't. First of all, the heat is so much, your eyes get blind because you are constantly sweating in your eyes. It's not possible. So we had to do it, but look at the artwork that they are doing. Look at the perfection that they are doing. Look at, they, they are going up in order to go to reach to this point. They go two meter up, one meter in, two meter up, one meter in, two meter up. They are going up to reach to this point. And at the end, at this point, accuracy is plus minus two millimeter. It's not done in United States. It is absolutely not done. Mr. Arthur Erickson, the number one architect of Canada. Many of you may know him. He has designed a Canadian embassy in Washington, DC. He's so famous. Any famous theater and museum and this and that in, in many of the work in Canada is his work. He came to India, he came to this temple, and he has written in our book that this building is the proof that still at this time miracle is possible. Then when he came to office and we were having coffee together, he said, Mr. Saba, do you know why you could do this job? In my opinion, that nobody else has done it. And that is why it has received all of those awards. Gold Award of the Institute of Structural Engineers for something that has never been achieved before. It says, uh, he said that because in my opinion, no one in this site had experience. If you had experience, you could not do it. And he's right. We, we, we did not have that experience. No, we have never done it before. And no, never could do it later. I mean, because that atmosphere, this condition of India, all of those workers, but we did it. I said, we will work like this step by step, step by step, and we will concrete 
very slow. We go up very slow so that as we go one meter up, concrete at the bottom has found strength. And we go up and, okay, what you will do, you look at that. All of our reinforcement is galvanized reinforcement. For the first time done in the world, in, done in India, galvanized reinforcement. In the West, we are using a stainless steel. It's not available in India. We had to galvanize our own steel. It's so dangerous. I mean, those if there are engineers among you, they know that brittle, sorry, uh, hydrogen embrittlement is a phenomenon that when you, you galvanize steel that is twisted and bent, it will create, it will release the tank of zinc 400 degrees Celsius, it releases hydrogen in, and the hydrogen goes into the hair cracks, microscopic cracks of the reinforcement, and it will burst. So later on, a, a two inch thick diameter reinforcement bar, the size of my arm, if you hit it, it will break like a piece of wood because of that hydrogen. Unless you have done thorough in, in tests and examinations and all of that, which we did, I told them that all of this is possible with this Indian workers, with the same poor people. They have the jewel in them and we call that jewel out and it will not happen. They told me that Mr. Saba, that white dome, white concrete, all of the Indian labors, they chew pan. You know what is pan? It's something like tobacco and they chew it and then they spit. Even if you go to the house of president at the entrance, there is a bucket for a spit and the spit is exact color of blood. All of the Indians that are in the, among, this, among the listeners, they know that. Ajit can tell you, please tell them. It's just exactly the color of blood. Now you have 400 laborers working at night, 12 hours nonstop on that heat, 50 degrees Celsius during the day and during the night. Don't think that at the night, Delhi gets cool. No, it's hell all over in summer. And rain, at the same time you have rain, you have monsoon. I will show you that how we have covered everything with umbrella. I will show you right now. You can see the geometry, the complexity. We don't all of these shells to be all of that in one piece. Imagine all of this is going to go in one piece. Now, it's hot and we have to protect the reinforcement from heat of the sun and from the rain of the monsoon. So we have covered all of the dome with these uh, tarpaulins. And if you know that the tarpaulins are the best source of fire, so if they catch fire, the whole building goes directly to, to heaven. Uh, far 400 people are under this, imagine, all under this. And this, we have covered entire dome with these tarpaulins from the rain. All is covered. We start pouring concrete from the bottom, we go up. They tell me, what if one of these labors at night spit in this concrete? Either because he's by mistake, or because he's sick of your face, or because he's tired, tired and sick of his own life, or because he hates you, or because he wants to sabotage. One spit, when you open the concrete after, you cannot open this concrete, you have to complete the dome up to the top and then open it. And then you open it and it's bloody, Spit here, spit here. You can see that red color. What will happen? Said, no, we talk to the, we call the angel of the hidden in every heart of these labors. They will not do it. We did it, friends. And they never did anything wrong. We opened the temple dome and you saw that interior dome. That concrete was done by these labors. Look at this man, this man with the hat, with the helmet here. His name is Aptar Singh, Mr. Aptar Singh. He's a Sardarji, Sardar. It is. They had to shave their head 
this was at the time of the when Mrs. Gandhi was killed and there were riots and all of that. And many of Sardars, they shaved their, their, they cut their hairs so that it's, people don't realize they are Sardar. Anyhow, that one night we were working here at night. This concrete goes for 48 hours. That means two days and two nights. I was standing there, this man came to me. He, he spoke very bad English. But he told me um, that uh, I, I, I realized that he wants to say something. I looked at him. I said, Avtar Singh, you want to tell me something? He said, yes. He said, my mother told me today that you have to be ashamed of yourself that you are building a temple in the name of God for money. You should have worked kar seva, means voluntarily. He said, I told my mother that I need food for my children. And that's why I get money. But he said, I've come to tell you that my contribution is that I work much harder. That is my contribution. It really shook my heart so, so seriously. This is a jewel in this man or not. I will not move my finger eight hours for $2, not even for $20. Do you do that? I say, just shake your, move your finger. They are working all day for that, with that nobility. And I told them that we are building this temple. This is going to be a miracle in your name. You have done it. Without you, we couldn't do it. Show to the people of the world that you can do it. And I swear to Baha'u'llah, they did it so beautiful. And I think Baha'u'llah was with them all those nights. Look at this. People are working. Imagine the heat under that tarpaulin. The heat, they're constantly serving water with salt to people to drink because they get dehydrated. We had created several platforms so if somebody falls down, will be cut by another, another platform. Look at that. It's going up and up and up. And these plants are ready here. They're working. And there are hundreds of people under that tarpaulin. at night. This was the night that Aptar Singh told me that. So we go up, all of the concrete inside now is done, but we have not opened anything. We don't see anything. We don't know what happened. We don't know if somebody spit or not. We don't know if a rubbish fell down or not. We don't know if somebody's slipper fell in it or not because it's possible, but nothing happened, nothing. And then we went around symmetrically to complete. We had to do, there are nine petals of each one. We did three in symmetrical, one here, one you can see on, then it goes round, we do three, and then three, and then three, so that it's the symmetrical load on the, on the things. This was an American Baha'i that came to take a video, to take a film from a balloon. And then we covered all of that with marble. Carpenters, Indian carpenters, they did that marble. They had never touched marble before. They did it. And uh, Now this is when the temple is open and the, the meditation. You see that this geometry, this complexity is done. Now we have exactly as per last report of the House of Justice and the National Assembly of India, five and a half million 
visitors a year. Then there were 3 million visitors a year. CNN announced the most visited building in the world. Look at this and then imagine what would have happened if one of the laborers had done a mistake. How you count on 400 ordinary laborers that they speak in 10 different languages because they come from different states of India, each one. Each one of them, they have every, if there are, they are from 10 different localities, they speak 10 different languages, 400 people. That means every, every and we, have, we had 800 workers at site at a time, 800 workers. 400, they work on shifts like that. 800 workers divided to 10, that means every 80 of them has one translator who speaks either Hindu, either Hindi or English. Most of them had to speak English because the, the only language that they knew other than their own language, these people in every state was even, it was English. That is why it was uh, really used. Imagine that these workers with this way of concreting have done that concrete. This is miracle or not? In this space, this is one of the spaces in that dome. See, this is inside. We had to choose small labors to fit in. Inside, they use their helmets and the temple is now finished. And what I want to say is that now I want to show you that how temple is becoming now the symbol of unity of mankind. Look at the crowd of the people. This is just an ordinary day, ordinary day. It's unbelievable. Today, they are sometimes 400 meters of line that they are going because of now, because of limitations and now security. The government is forcing security because the temple is, uh, you know, uh, India, because of the compl complications that they have India. In India, they have to do, be careful about security. Some of the pictures just for you to have a feeling looking through India. These are at the time of construction, last days. This is a museum that we have made at the temple that shows, introduced the Baha'i faith and all of that. And it shows the way that the construction was made a museum of tools. Look at the tools. This is drill, drill. The one that each one of you have a, I don't know, Black and Decker or Hilti drill in your garage. Some of you have four of them. This is the great drill that we had. I had to smuggle myself in my suitcase one drill, electric drill. We need 400 of them because there are more than 40,000 holes into the, into that have been done in the concrete. This is a drill by hand. These are all, this is the arrow and the, that magnificent artwork is done by these tools. These are bought by my people from the laborers at site, all of them. None of them has come from outside. Everything has had a role in construction of the temple. This is the complexity of the dome inside in a model. The symbol of all the religions at the temple, when you enter, you can see a Hindu temple, you can see a mosque, you can see a Baha'i temple, uh, and you can see uh, this is Christian church and all over. Queen Mary Romania, the peep Baha'is of the world, and so on. This is 
world famous musician that has passed away, Ravi Shankar of India, who this is just an ordinary day at the temple. That is the museum at the top. You see the one that you see at the end is like a hill. You go under it and, and you can go at the top of the hill and have the most beautiful view of the temple. Now, look at the books. Uh, this is modern architecture in India. Temple is the post-independent perspective, the, the symbol of the post-independent architecture of India. In this book, it's introduced. World architecture on the cover of the book were the most magnificent architectures of India done by Edin Lutin for British, the British Viceroy done by Le Corbusier in Chandigarh, done by Louis Kahn in Ahmedabad, are in this volume. And they have chosen the temple for the cover. AutoCAD of India, I do not, I have never ever used AutoCAD at the temple, for the temple. We used, at that time, really AutoCAD was not even known at, at the time, and uh, but they, they have chosen the temple as this to 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 tell how easy it is to design. We have done all by hand. All of this has been done by hand. Terraces was done by uh, computer, of course. The history of architecture, iconic buildings throughout the ages. A British writer. Man-made world, man-made wonders of the world. A very, very beautiful book. At the first page, the man-made wonders of the world are the best. If you look at this book, please look at uh, on internet, you can find it. And uh, there are marvelous monuments and temples, ancient temples of the world, Persepolis. Everything is in this book. And here is on the cover of the American scientist, which was done by those Indian workers. The government of India using the temple of India as the symbol of unity of religions. Government, not, nothing done by Baha'is. This is army, military. A parade, National Independent Day of India at presence of Prime Minister and some of the presidents of the world. And look at that. Under that model, they have a Muslim, a, sorry, a Christian, a Muslim, a Hindu, and a Sikh that they are carrying the temple of India as the symbol of unity of religions. It is written there. It's written in the, in the, the monument. This is another exhibition. I don't know how many, 7,000 flowers in this monument. Incredible India. The, this was a tourist uh, activity of the government of India. Baha'i House of Worship. India's symbol of communal harmony. India's symbol of the oneness of humankind. This is the poster of the government of India. This is a poster of the government of India. Magnificence in stone. And here it says, World Heritage Site. And it says, uh, at, under that, it says, symbol of the unity of mankind. This is a poster of the government of India, Ministry of Tourism in Ottawa, Canada. Baha'i House of Worship, India's symbol of unity of religions. Do you see on that? Ministry of Tourism. This has nothing with the Baha'is. This is a airport. I don't know where, where uh, I believe it is in New Zealand, but I'm not 100% sure because I have so many of them. I can show you till tomorrow morning of these things. 
Here also it says India's symbol of communal harmony. This is governor of Delhi that is giving the award because to the temple as the symbol of uh, unity of mankind. One night at the temple. Pres Prime Minister of India, current Prime Minister of India, head of the Hindustan <laughs> most fanatic party, symbol of the party is uh, Lotus, Lotus, and they call their, their announcement is Hindustan for Hindus. He's carrying, showing to the people the temple of India as the symbol of the progress made in India. India soars high, the report. It is the, the report that the government has commissioned and it is done and the temple behind it. That is all. And I apologize if it took longer than what I wanted. Thank you. Thank you very much. What a magnificent building. What a magnificent presentation. Uh, people, put your questions in chat if you have any. Uh, Mr. Saba, I have a, several questions that have come in I want to ask you. Please. May I? Yes, yes. It says, what is the spiritual significance of the Mother Temple? Is there plans to build more temples in India? All of them. All of them are significant spiritually. And I all of my talk was about the subject. Um, I think because you use the term mother temple, that's the question. I, I never use the, the word mother temple. Mother temple is translation from Ummul Ma'abed because beloved guardian and uh, I've said that. In principle, there are continental temples that beloved guardian called them Ummul Ma'abed, but then there will be national temples and there will be uh, local temples. National temples will be in the capital of different countries that they don't have a temple. For example, this temple is in India. Pakistan doesn't have a, a, a temple, mother temple. So they will build a temple in their center, in their, con their maybe their capital as the, their national temple. And later on, there will be a temple maybe in every city of Pakistan or every city of Japan or every city of United States. I don't know. Today, there is one temple in uh, Chicago as the mother temple of India. But these are only titled the Baha'i temples are all symbol of unity of mankind and unity of God and unity of religions. And they are all spiritually significant, all of them, same. But they're at the same way that the Baha'i faith is significant, whether it is in a village or it is in a Washington DC or it is in Moscow. It's significant. It's the same thing, spiritual. There is no, in my opinion, there is no difference or difference in spiritual significance if the temple is temple of a village or temple of a continent. That's my opinion. Question. There's a question that says, was there any fatalities during construction at the site? Did anybody get killed during construction? No, we had uh, one, uh, uh, they were digging a, a well, a tube well, a, mm -hmm. not tube, sorry, an open well, open well, and at the temple, and one person was killed in that well, because, but that was not a part of the construction of the temple, it was done at the thieves, otherwise there was no, we had done so many things uh, to stop, uh, uh, because that construction was extremely dangerous, uh, fire was one of our major, major 
problems. And we had almost 20, I don't know, 25 or 28 fires at the temple. And, uh, but we had made arrangements to fight the fire because the government firefighting and the department of firefighting uh, told us that they cannot help us because the temple is too high and the radius of the access to the building right. is too short. And the building at the beginning was all wood. And this is a religious building where those of you know that fortunately, fortunately what we had done, I want to tell you so interesting a story that uh, one night, I, you remember I told you that I went to that church, to that uh, temple, Hindu temple, and I talked to them about that this is the temple of Mataji and all of that. One night, my security guard that was a Baha'i, uh, the head of the security was a Baha'i supervisor um, that he's now in Australia, uh, Mr. Nabi. He was there and he, uh, I hope uh, uh, I'm giving the correct uh, names right now uh, for that event. Uh, uh, you remember at that time I was very young and at this time right now I am not, very young at all. So, uh, but I have written all of those things in different documents. Now, he called me at home and he said, Mr. Saba, please rush, come, come, come. I said, what is wrong? He said that, please come, something is happening. So I jumped in my car and it was only 10 minutes to reach to the temple. So I came to the temple. As I reached to the temple, he ran toward my car and he said, everything is okay, everything is okay. I said, what was wrong? He said that I saw that hundreds of people from the temple, from the Kal Kalkaji temple are coming, walking toward our temple. And uh, I, they are sitting on the border of the temple. And I was so nervous that God knows what they want to do. I mean, they can easily think that these are some, you know, I don't know, these are, related to the Muslims or their foreigners and this or that, they can set the building in fire. They can attack the temple like many, many temples have been attacked by Hindus. By And uh, uh, so he said that I was so worried, but he said, when I went, I went close and I asked from a couple of these uh, villages, what is, what's happening? He said that the, the Pandit, that priest told us that, uh, has told us that this is a new house for Kali. After this is built, this building is built, the Kali will move to this new temple. So we are coming to say prayer in advance. I was so touched, so moved that this is this, the case. And really, this is so, and really the, this, the concept of Lotus is the one who has, which has saved us. One night I was, I had dinner recently, not, not recently, I mean, many years after construction of the temple, I was in India and uh, I had gone for a visit or inspection or something. And uh, uh, I was invited by the secretary of the national assembly to have dinner in a place called India International. It's a sort of international club that many foreigners, many distinguished Indians, they come and eat dinner. So I was there. I noticed that Mr. Advani, Mr. A.K. Advani, the president of the Bharata Janata party, the party that says Hindustan for Hindus, the party that attacked and recently the followers of that party, they damaged, they destroyed the, the mosque that was built in a place of a Hindu temple uh, in Ayodhya place, Ayodhya mosque. Uh, these people that really they are, they don't like foreigners, they don't like other religions other than Hindu temple. He was having dinner with his wife at the India International Center. They were sitting there alone. As we wanted to go out, I stood, uh, I stopped at his desk as his table. And I said, Mr. Advani, I'm so, Honor to see you. I was, I am the architect of the Lotus Temple and I was honored when I was here 10 years, I was here and I 
and had heard so many things about you and I know you and I just wanted to say hello. He said, oh, welcome, welcome, please sit here, please sit. I sat in his table with the secretary of the National Assembly and he said, you know, Mr. Sabo, there is a beautiful Baha'i temple in United States. Have you seen it? I said, yes, I've seen it. It's in Chicago and Illinois and all of that. And I have been there several times. He said, I was there and uh, a very young, nice young lady was guiding me and the tele sh show, showing me around. She was very polite. She was very welcoming. And uh, she said, uh, um, I told her that, uh, have you seen our temple? Our temple? And she said that she took me, she, she took my hand and took me to a auditorium. And there they were showing a video of the, of the temple, of the Lotus Temple. And I told them that, look, our temple is more beautiful. I was so really moved that here, look at that, a person that should, he called the temple, my temple, our temple. This is exactly what we wanted to do. And in fact, when that, that mosque was, that the mosque was destroyed and uh, recently there is always dispute whether they have to rebuild the Hindu temple in that place or a mosque. And there is a dispute. One of the very famous South Indian uh, scholars and Hindu uh, leader wrote, he said that in my opinion, they should not neither build a Hindu temple nor a mosque. They have to build a Baha'i temple because it's open to everyone. And you sh I, I showed you that video, that picture, sorry, that photograph of uh, um, uh, the, the governor of Delhi that was giving awards, you saw that picture. That lady on that day at presence of, I would say 3000 Baha'is that they were in the gathering, uh, she said that his, her talk is available on Google, on internet. I have the link. Um, I can send it to Ajit and she can share it with you. He can share it with you. He speaks in front, she spoke in front of all of you. She said, today as I was coming here, my granddaughter, small, young granddaughter, seven, six, seven years old, told me that I wanted to come with you. Can you take me to the Baha'i temple? I said, how is that all of these years I have gone everywhere, you never asked me to come. Now you want to come to Baha'i Temple. He said, she said, because when I grow up, this is what the governor says. He said, when I grow up, I may become Baha'i. I said, oh, why? How you know that? What do you know about the Baha'is? What do you know about the Baha'i Temple? She said, oh, you don't know internet? Everything is there, read it. He said that, but she said, I told her that, but she said, you know, she said, Baha'is, they love everybody. They like everybody. So if I, be, if I become a Baha'i, I am friend with everyone. She said, this is my granddaughter. Can you believe it? She's telling me. So this is it. And the effect of the temple I had, I can show you there. You can find it in uh, Facebook. Um, several stories that I have said, I have given uh, on Zoom maybe 17 or 18 or 20 stories I have said on Zoom, and I've showed the slides and things uh, about the temple and about the shrine of the Bab. And uh, in that I have shown so many documents and videos and everything to show that how people of India pay respect to the temple of India, and they love it. And uh, there they had put, um, there is a temple in South of Delhi, uh, South of India, uh, from Ganesh. Ganesh is the elephant god. I mean, Ganesh is one of the most beloved god, gods of India. And everybody loves Ganesh. And uh, in that, Mr. Afshin, counselor of India at that time, now he's retired, um, he sent me a picture. He sent me a thing. He said that in this year, uh, they have made a big uh, model of the temple in this, this Ganesh temple. And they, I, I said, I asked why, they said Ganesh every year blesses one Hindu temple that 
his disciples should go that year for pilgrimage to that temple. This year, Ganesh has blessed the, the, the Baha'i temple. And we have it. Uh, question here is that when the temple was designed, was there any plans made for dependencies like orphanages, home for the elderly, etc.? cetera? Um, uh, we built it at that time, we built only the temple. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on, of course, a, a new construction has been built for uh, junior youth and all of that to come for mm -hmm. it. However, you have to know that most of our Baha'i temples, almost all of the Baha'i temples that I have visited, the land is not enough for, you know that if you want to build uh, dependencies of the temple, Baha'i temples include university, includes library, includes place for orphanage, include elder, elderly homes. Each one of these is larger than the temple itself. Today, are you, I don't know. When you say university, do you know what's the size of university? University of Delhi is, University of Cambridge is a city. University of Delhi is a city. Jawaharlal Nehru University is a city. I have gone, I've been invited by many of the universities in India, and in IIT, Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, uh, all of these, each one is a city. By itself, so you cannot done cannot be done within the vicinity, but it cannot be done within the property. But House of Justice have clarified that it can be done under the auspicious of the temple in the vicinity in the lands that there. So in some temples, some of them have been established. In some temples, not yet. And right now, it's uh, uh, we need even. To administrate these things, we need lots of uh, energy and uh, uh, budget and all of those things. These things, many of these things is possible when we have much more number of Baha'is in those, those localities and that they can finance it and they can do all of that. And so far they are doing whatever they can. And uh, right now we have at the temple, we have built a place for volunteers. All of the volunteers that they come to do that, they stay there. We have a place for uh, junior youth that they come and uh, we have a place for uh, st study of the Baha'i history. We have a library with uh, many of the holy books and writings, but uh, not orphanage or this or that's mm -hmm. many of them. Uh, um, I was scheduled to stay at the men's dorm March and April of 2020, before COVID shut it down. Yes. So the question here is, what was the duration of the project from start to finish? 10 years. Uh, we did um, six months. It took for me to do the preliminary design and be approved by the House of Justice, six months do a study and then design and present it to the house, six months. One and a half year in England to produce the working drawings, documents for contract and structural engineering, mechanical works and plumbing works and others. One and a half year and six months, so two years. Two years was done for this. Then I went to India. It took us two years to uh, get the building permits and sanctions and all of that. And meanwhile, do earthwork, excavation work. All of the earthwork is done by hand. You saw the photographs by hammer and chisel and hand. The work that can be done with bulldozers and excavators, which I have done the most monumental excavation on Mount Carmel, all on rocks, sometimes 30 meters deep down. We have done that and we did all of that in few months. In India is done by hand. You break the rocks piece by piece and these rocks are quite strong. Some of them are like a granite. So they have to, you have to break it piece by piece and every 
labor carries one piece in their head and they go and dump it somewhere and come back and all of that. And uh, all of that work. It took almost two years. We do all of those things and get at the same time approvals and permissions and do some contract uh, relationship and uh, do some mock-ups and samples and all of that. And then uh, this is four years and six years to really do the whole structure mm -hmm. uh, from superstructure really mm -hmm. after done, foundations are done, the superstructure and landscape and everything. There's a few messages here for you personally, people thanking you. I will read one. No, no, please this send them by email. Thank you okay. so much. You can send all of them by email to me. Right. Thank you. I am so grateful to all of the friends. And I have been always in, in much more than what I deserve. I have been showered with love and uh, support of the dear friends. And I'm so grateful to you. Thank you so much. We are most grateful that you agreed to do this. We are honored that you agreed to do this. And being from India, having been to the temple, having listened to Ravi Shankar's music when I was there, I'm moved by your presentation. And I'm, I'm like uh, LK Advani saying, this is my temple. <laughs> yes. I take ownership of this temple. Um, I pray that all of you that have a desire to go will get a chance to go. It is the most magnificent building. It is a, it, it, you will be remembered for a thousand years for the building of this temple, Mr. Saba. Thank, Thank you, you so very much, much for what you have done for the faith. I tell Thank you, you, what you said is absolutely true. That, uh, believe me, I have worked on all of those details and I know them better than my hand. But every time I go to the temple, I really see, when I see the real dimension in reality, it's so completely, uh, really overwhelming. And it's really important that you see the temple. The photographs are not just justice. For, for the rest of the friends, dear friends, we will have convene again on June the 4th uh, with Dr. Robert Henderson giving talk, speaking about the cost of racism, material, spiritual, and moral. I will be sending out invitations to you shortly. Mr. Saba, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night.